Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our third annual Urban Design Lecture Series, Voices of Community. My name is Alex Cerulean, and I am a third year part-time MCRP student concentrating in design. And I also serve as the undergraduate, I mean, as the graduate chair for EWB Designs. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. We have the Rutgers University Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. We have the American Institute of Architects, the AIA um, of New York Center for Architecture. And we also have Arctober, New York City's Architecture and Design Festival, which hosts events and lectures like this one during the month of October throughout the entire year. So who are we? EJB Designs is a student organization at the Blaustein School that utilizes drawing to educate students and in innovative graphic negotiation skills. EJB Designs began as a group of planning students and faculty seeking to improve their hand drawing skills and dig digital graphic techniques. This group of students also were involved, um, evolved into an organization that aims to reestablish the core values at the foundation of hand drawing the value of which is often overlooked throughout planning and, and the design process. We hold events and biweekly drawing sessions throughout the year to help develop leaders and high, highly skilled develop designers who are engaged in drawing, rendering, and computer, computer generation. Uh, through practice and social networking, our organization members prepare to enter the workforce as confident and innovative planning and design professionals. So on behalf of EJP Designs, I thank you for joining us for this important discussion about community development and urban design. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Alexander, and I'm a senior in the undergraduate urban planning and design program and the undergraduate chair of EJB Designs. The Urban Design Lecture Series is hosted annually by EJB Designs and seeks to create awareness of development issues affecting our civic unity by forming a discussion around an integral concept to urbanism, the community. In our first lecture in 2019, Designing Value, we opened a discussion about the goals of urban design and its ultimate impact on communities. We specifically focused on the influence that design has on providing equitable access to quality living and to various areas of a city or place. Urban design is often used to generate design value and it is used to substantiate citizen buy-in, promising a better quality of life, a stronger tax base and more opportunities. In the second lecture last year, we discussed urban design and its role in the cultivation of meaningful public spaces. We sought to explore how successful public realms are designed, researched, and experienced against the backdrop of community needs and social change. In doing so, we honored the legacy of urbanist William H. White on the 50th anniversary of his pioneering study of New York City's public realm. And today, for our third lecture, we examine the practice of community development in the context of the coronavirus pandemic and continued social change. What was already a public policy and planning imperative is even further at the forefront of government efforts at all levels. The post-pandemic vision of cities will depend on successful community organizing, sound urban design, and evolving policy to promote equitable redevelopment. But how can com communities begin to lay the groundwork for these monumental tasks? Our presenters will discuss the impact and importance of urban design on community redevelopment efforts and how the broader post-pandemic strategy will evolve to meet these needs. Today, we're pleased to welcome Sarah Combs, the Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of the University Area Community Development, Development Corporate Corporation in Tampa, Florida. Since Ms. Combs joined the organization in 2010, the UACDC, has more than tripled the number of children and adults it reaches with its education, health, workforce, and cultural arts program. Her main focus at the UACDC is the holistic redevelopment of the Uptown University area of Tampa. She created the three-year uh, neighborhood transformation strategy in an effort to stabilize the community and prevent gentrification, and now seeks to grow the university area by enabling residents to become change agents to improve the economic and social conditions of their community. Ms. Combs has more than 18 years of experience in the nonprofit sector, spanning nearly every faucet of the organization from program development to land banking, banking and real estate. Following Sarah will be our second speaker, Eric Fang. 
Mr. Fang is a principal at Perkins Eastman and has led large scale urban redevelopment, transit facility and campus planning projects for public agencies, private developers and large institutions nationally and internationally. He has worked with transit agencies throughout the country, in particular New Jersey Transit, in promoting transit oriented development and smart growth and has worked extensively with towns and cities throughout the United States to adapt to the impacts of climate change, promote community resiliency, and develop strategies for more sustainable growth. Among his recent projects are Arvern by the Sea, a transit-oriented community in New York's Rockaway Peninsula, which has become a widely cited case study for resilient community design, and the Hoboken Green Infrastructure Strategic Plan. Eric has written and lectured extensively for publications such as Urban Land, Plan Edison, and Architectural Record and holds degrees from Columbia University and the Harvard University Graduate School of Design, where he co-edited the Harvard Architecture Review. Now, please welcome Ms. Sarah Combs. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm gonna uh, share my screen and uh, have a lot of great information to present to you today. Uh, so I hope that you are ready to learn all about community development and what we're doing in the university area community. Uh, before I begin, just want to do a screen check to make sure you can you can see my presentation. Thumbs up. All right. Um, so uh, like the uh, introduction said, my name is Sarah Combs and I'm the CEO at the University Area CDC. Uh, and I am going to talk to you a little bit about the important work that we're doing in the university area community in regards to community development. So we can get these slides going. There we go. Uh, so who are we and what do we do? Well, University Area CDC is a private uh, public nonprofit uh, organization who's really dedicated to improving the university area and working with the residents in order to do so. We have a lot of different programs and services that are listed here of which I'm not gonna be able to go into, but I think it's important to highlight just how many different programs and services that we offer. We have cultural arts programming, youth and adult education, health and wellness programming. We focus on crime and safety in this community, which is really important. We also do a lot of community engagement, which you'll hear about from the grassroots initiative up. Uh, we have a workforce development program called Invest, and we focus a lot on uh, attainable housing and building attainable housing. We also focus on self-sufficiency programs and really helping meet residents where they are. We focus on transportation or uh, in my community, the lack of transportation uh, and making sure that we're getting uh, the transportation that the residents need. And we do all of this through a coalition of partners that really rally together. We meet uh, on a quarterly basis at our partners coalition gathering, which we actually have one tomorrow morning. Um, we're about 220 members of the community, uh, business organizations, uh, government, uh, students come together to talk about needs in the community and how we can really achieve those needs by working together as a community uh, impact model. Our service area boundaries, uh, this isn't so specific to you all since you're not from uh, Tampa, Florida, but uh, it's important to know that we do have a primary focus area that we're focusing on trying to measure that impact and change that we're creating through all of the innovative uh, programs and services that we've done. Uh, so that is the focus area. We do serve all of Hillsborough County as well, which is a very large county. And we also go into nine different counties with our cultural arts programming. The other piece that's really important to note is that all of this area, all of our primary focus area is deemed a redevelopment area by Hillsborough County, which has infused some opportunities to be able to help with our community planning and development efforts. Uh, we were also able to get five census tracts in opportunity zones, which is um, supposed to help our, our effort of revitalizing the area. And we're still working on how to bring that into our capital stack in order to really uh, create opportunity for change for housing in this area. Uh, the other important thing to note is um, we're also in this area called Innovation District, an Uptown Innovation District, which means they see our urban area as an opportunity for huge growth and expansion. Um, our mall up the, up the street um, has pledged a $2 billion investment into this area. Companies and businesses are being sought from around the world to come and relocate here. So there's a lot of opportunity that are, that are, that's happening around our community. Um, but for me, what does that mean for our community? And how do we ensure that our community doesn't get gentrified? And when I say gentrified, I mean place, displaced, so moved out of the community. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So it's important to bring that concept in. 
So who are we serving in this community that I talk about? Um, our population is about 25,000. Uh, the per media income is about $14,000. We have a 38% poverty rate, 31% have no vehicles. So it's a highly walkable and bikeable community, which is really important tonight to note. 80% are minorities in our community. We have a 9% unemployment rate um, and 89% uh, of our residents are renting. So we have about a 10% home ownership rate. So with statistics like that, uh, where do you start? How do you begin? Uh, I often say it's one of those things where you, you talk about all the challenges of the area. Well, this is where I'm gonna you know, talk about the strengths of the area. And that's really what our organization is doing is taking a strength-based approach to community development and planning. We're looking at you know, what are the strengths of the, organ or of the community and how do we really uh, build around those strengths to be able to create meaningful change in the community and make sure that it's equitable change. So you know, we're looking at um, making sure that residents get to be a part of you know, all of the wonderful things that we're talking about. So how we started was uh, we moved into the community and started uh, speaking with the community. We did a community needs assessment, which we're, we do every two years to identify the needs of the community and learn what are the important things that the community wants to see change or happen there. And from that information, we came back to the table and we were able to create um, uh, a leaders collective, which is made up of residents in the community that want to amplify their voice. They want to share what's really happening in this community that they call home. And what better way to be able to build a community than by getting the input from residents, right? Crazy idea. You actually ask the residents what they want to see, and then you incorporate that into, into your plan. And so we were able to create a leaders collective by uh, bringing together residents in the community that really wanted to talk about um, change happening and, and make, make sure that their voice was elevated to those decision makers. And so that's what we did. And as we were doing that, we formed our uh, neighborhood transformation strategy as a means to really uh, improve the community through, through the lens of the community and, and what the residents were, were telling us. Uh, that plan was so incredibly important because we were able to get others involved uh, in the plan where their assets were. And so uh, not only did it help us to be able to communicate with stakeholders and partners and businesses, but it also allowed us to be able to say, this is our plan that we've laid out. Where can you come in and, and help and be able to move that change forward? As you can see, it the plan really focuses on the built environment. Um, we're in the heart of the urban core. And so how do we really look at the landscape of the community and, and change it from the inside out? And those plans really started with uh, uh, seven acres in the heart of the community. We thought we were going to build housing. That's what we thought the community needed. And then we went and asked the community and they said, we wanted a park. We want a place where our kids can play and have fun. And we want a place where neighbors can meet each other and create that uh, community efficacy that's so missing in this community. We want a safe place. Uh, there's no parks in this community. It's concrete. And so we want a place where we can breathe and run and play and, and do all of those things that other communities have. And so we were surprised by that. And so we said, okay, so we're going to be building a park. Um, we're in, we're the first private park uh, in Hillsborough County. I haven't sought outside of our county to see how many other private parks there are, but there's not a lot. Um, and uh, we were very excited about doing the, doing the community engagement. Uh, and we learned from the community what they wanted at the park. They wanted a playground. They wanted a multi-purpose sports field. They wanted a, uh, community garden and a hope center where they could do kitchen, uh, cooking classes and things of that nature. And so it took us about four years. Um, but we were able to successfully open our park uh, a couple years ago, Harvest Hope Park, and we made the commitment to provide everything that the community wanted. Uh, so we put in a playground, a multi-purpose sports field, outdoor fitness equipment, uh, a one, a two acre freshwater pond that we stock with catfish and it's a spring fed pond. Uh, so you can eat those catfish. Uh, and today we just, uh, we just poured a thousand bluegill into the pond, which is really exciting. Uh, we also have a 33 bed organic community garden and a teaching kitchen, a classroom at the Hope Center. Uh, and we're putting in a splash park uh, this year as well. So very excited about it in the heart of the urban core. You can go uh, catch a fresh fish, go pick organic veggies and cook a healthy, sustainable meal from the heart of the community. And the best part is, is that we're programming this too. So we have uh, cheerleading with football and soccer going on. 
Uh, we have cooking classes, like I said, and all kinds of activities happening at the park. And you know, that's really the model that we're creating. How do you change a community um, that has been plagued for you know decades that hasn't seen change? And we say, you know, you change it from the inside out. And so we started with this park. The park is so incredibly important because it's the catalyst for growth and development in this community, a community that you know has been forgotten and frozen in time for decades. Uh, the community that they've called suitcase city because you never stayed long enough to unpack your suitcase. Well, it was important for us to be able to show that there is promise in this community. Uh, and we are gonna start by, sh by showing this commitment of a park to the residents in that community. And uh, it started with the park. And then we went on to build uh, creative placemaking throughout the community. We believe in the power of art and the power um, of bringing people together to create art. And so, as you can see, we've we've uh, instilled um, hope, love, and peace throughout the community in these creative placemaking projects. And so, when you drive into our community uh, at our park, you'll see hope, um, and at our front main office, you'll see love and peace. And we're bringing joy in about six months to our community, which we're really excited about and figuring out where we're going to place that. Uh, the other the other things that we you know we did are um, building community family statutes, um, having residents paint, paint pictures of themselves actually, or of each other, uh, doing dream boxes throughout the community and making sure that we're tying into volunteers to be able to incorporate all of these great change that's happening. We also did murals. Uh, we painted our basketball courts. We want to bring life and vibrancy to this community. Uh, and we think it's critically important. It's also a way of wayfinding um, in our community. People have driven by our community and never knew it really existed. And so when, when you now talk about it, you can say, turn at love, uh, turn left at love and right at hope, uh, or talk about, you know, the dream box that you can make a left at, um, you know, all of these different uh, creative placemaking projects are really important in the community. We launched our, our dream box initiative when we found out that residents in our community didn't have access to books. Uh, we created a program called our dream box program and we launched 20 of those throughout the community. Uh, what we learned as a secondary benefit is that um, kids in our community were actually teaching the adults how to read, which were just just amazing. And so we then started uh, stocking the, the dream boxes with uh, books that were Spanish and um, Creole and Haitian um, because that makes up a large portion of our population. So that was really imp important as well as to really understand the demographic that you're serving to be able to meet them um, where they are. And we, and we learned that lesson through this project. Um, and so of course the books are free. You can come and drop by the, the dream box and pick up a book. Um, we stock them every month and they run out because they're so excited uh, about getting a new book. And uh, it's really cool to see a line at the book uh, at, the, at the dream box. It's also, we found, a place for residents to congregate and discuss and talk about topics or issues that are happening in the community. Uh, so that's really, really cool to see. The other piece that's been uh, really in, in uh, really important uh, in the work that we're doing um, is the asset of land. You know, how do you change the uh, urban design of a community if you don't own it, right? We talked about 10% home ownership in this community. How do you ensure that residents get to stay in this community if, if the majority of the, the land and the properties and the asset are owned by people who have, live up north or, you know, uh, out west? Um, so if you own the land, you get to determine what happens with the land. And so we launched our land, our real estate arm, Harvest Hope Properties, uh, about 2016. Uh, and through that, we launched our land banking initiative uh, as a means to um, acquire property, put it out to residents, talk to residents about what they wanted to see on that property, and then be able to build on that property. Uh, and that has been so incredibly instrumental as a tool in our toolbox to be able to redevelop this community. Uh, and since we did that, we've acquired 23 properties within a one mile radius of Harvest Hope Park. So again, our, our design and our approach is a clustered approach to community development. We're not spot shotting, we're not buying property up. Uh, we're buying it in a, in, in a way that really can connect with each other and we can build off of each of those developments. Um, and it also helps with uh, you know, uh, challenging the blight that's in the community and really uh, being able to benefit from all the synergies around the developments that we're doing. We've invested about 1.5 million of our own funding uh, we've leveraged uh, about a about a million dollars. I need to up, up that uh, statistic, and uh, you know it's paid off because our property values are about two point five million. And I haven't done that recently, so I'm sure it is so much more because housing and land are crazy prices right now. Um, but that's about a you know invested about three point five million just in land value in our community. Uh, you know, after we did that, we started to get to work. Uh, so one of the first things that we did was uh, we acquired. Uh, 
five lots across the street from the park. We subdivided those lots and we said, okay, what are we gonna do? We're gonna build home ownership because again, that statistics of less than 10% home ownership has to change in order to stabilize this community. And so we said, let's pull in our partners. Who does housing really well? Well, let's invite Habitat because again, it's important that our residents get the opportunity of home ownership here in this community and that opportunity of building wealth. Um, you know, that's one of the best ways to build wealth is uh, through home ownership. And so being able to allow the residents who live here to be able to, you know, put down roots and be able to build that generational wealth that is so missing in this community. So we partnered with Habitat and we built 10 homes across the street from the park. One of the other things that I sought out to do is uh, we have a lot of single mothers in our community that are just, they're struggling. Um, and the amount of rent that they were paying was just crazy. So I said, there has to be a product that we can build, uh, an innovative product that we can build uh, and create home ownership for less than $100,000. Uh, so I went out and talked to a lot of builders and everyone was like, you're crazy. There's no way you can build a house like that for under $100,000. So I said, well, what if we took a modular product we re-engineered it in order to meet the Florida Building Code and pass inspection. Um, and then we were able to provide that as a home ownership opportunity. They said, well, you could do that, but no one has done that, uh, not in this area. And so we said, well, there's a will, there's a way. And uh, we were able to just to do exactly that. We took a modular product, we re-engineered it in order to meet the, the Florida Building Code and pass inspection. Took a little bit more time and energy because no one had, to, had done it before, um, but we were able to launch our sound and secure housing program. And that's uh, an opportunity for home ownership. So it's a lease to home ownership product and single moms um, are be able to have this uh, in less than a year become homeowners. And so this house that you see right here that we cut ribbon on, her name's Helga. She's gonna be actually uh, having the keys and owning the home in about a month. Um, and she was paying previously about $1,200 for rent now her mortgage will be 750. So there, it is possible. It takes a little bit of uh, hard work to you know, do innovative solutions, um, but it is possible with a little bit of hard work and great partners. Uh, we had TD Bank Foundation that seeded us the funding to be able to get it started. And now we're looking to grow that program as well. The other thing that we have throughout our community that we've uncovered um, is a lack of in infrastructure. And so if you're a community developer, you can't necessarily develop a community on shoddy infrastructure. And so what I found from uh, conversations with the community is I was talking with uh, residents actually uh, at our park, uh, moms actually, and they were telling me that they can't bathe their children. And I just couldn't understand what they meant by that. And they said, you know, the water's bad. And they said it's giving us ringworm, UTIs, all, all kinds of you know, terrible things, terrible infections um, because of the water. So we called out the health department and had them come out and test the water, high levels of lead and chlorine and other things. Um, and we found out that that was on a, a, a well system and the well um, obviously hadn't been upkept. And so it was contaminating the water. Uh, and so, you know, we, we, we got that, that issue rectified, unfortunately, it took about a year to do it. And uh, they had to sell the property to a new owner and the new owner did it. New owner helped us to, um, to you know, to ratify that issue. Um, but we started to uncover that that was not just a isolated incident. Um, we did uh, additional assessment to learn there's so many wells in our community uh, that are bad and they're uh, leading to contamination in the water. One of the surveys that we did in the community, the number one thing that people um, said that they are requesting is good water. No one's buying or everyone's buying bottled water because no one could drink the water. The other thing that we found out is uh, we also have an issue with our sewer. Um, while we're in the heart of the urban core, just steps away from University of South Florida, uh, a lot of our properties don't have access to sewer and they're on septic, septic, septic systems that have gone bad. So we have a major issue that we've uncovered over the last couple of years. Um, and this map, uh, if you know how to read this map, you'd see that there is a lot of issues. So we finally got the attention of the mayor and we're working to solve that issue, but it's going to cost millions upon millions of dollars uh, to be able to address that issue. The other issue that we've uh, really taken a, a, a stance on is um, the lack of sidewalks in our community. Kids are getting hit by cars. There's no ways for mom to, moms to push strollers in this community because there's no sidewalks. And so we're launching our sidewalks initiative plan. Um, and I'm happy to say that uh, as we speak right now, sidewalks are getting installed in the community because it's critically important. That's the walkability of the community. We did a walkability study and it showed surprise, uh, no sidewalks which I thought was silly that we had to go to all that trouble to do, to do a study, but they needed the documentation to show there's no sidewalks. Uh, we're also putting in crosswalks in the community and lighting um, because we think it's so incredibly important to be able to have a community that people feel safe in and they feel safe traveling. Uh, and so we're working on that initiative as well. 
I'm really excited to share with you our neighborhood transformation strategy that shows uh, six redevelopment projects that we're trying to accomplish in the next five years. So um, hope you can stick with me because I'm going to go pretty fast. We have a lot of uh, exciting work that we're doing. Uh, so this just, again, focuses, uh, shows you the map of our primary service area. This is the area that we're really spoke uh, specifically focusing on trying to measure the impact of all of the innovative solutions and programs that we're creating and seeing if we can create um, a level, level of change that can then can be modeled and adapted to other communities um, in the United States. We're working with a lot of different, uh, different cities throughout the U.S. and showing them that the work that we're doing and having them adopt it. Um, and then, you know, obviously mold it and change it to fit their communities, but we're just so excited to share the work because we think that this can be transferred over to other communities as well. So our first one is our cultural campus. And as you can see from the map, right in the middle is Harvest Hope Park. So again, I said it's a clustered approach to community development, it's starting from the inside out. So we're starting at the park. And then you can see all the developments that are, are surrounding it. That's how we're changing the community from the inside out and really focusing on that collective impact model. So the cultural campus is right across the street from the park. Um, and the mission of the cultural campus is to serve as a navigational hub, connecting community residents with anchored partners who are providing direct programming and services through a holistic approach. Now, if you heard me talk about the community, we talked about a lot of challenges, right? There's a lot of uh, negative aspects to the community and those negative stats. But what about the positives? We have a lot of wonderful things happening in the community. And as I spoke, we're talking about a strength-based approach. So the cultural campus is just that. We have a melting pot of cultures in this community. And what is the best way to be able to unify people is through their cultures and to be able to celebrate that. And so that's really the reason for the cultural campus is to celebrate and unify the cultures of this community, bring them together and focus on that strength-based approach. Uh, so the cultural campus, uh, we went to residents in the community um, and during COVID, you can do community engagement. People say you can't, oh, no one can do it, so we can't pack them into a gym and help hold a conversation. Well, that might be the case, but you can certainly still do community engagement. It might look a little different. We did drive-through style community engagement. We said we had residents sit on the corner and had um, them collecting responses from the community. It certainly can be done. So that's what we did with the cultural campus. We put it out to the community. We said, what do you wanna see at the cultural campus? What kind of services do you want? These were all the items that they had to choose from. Um, and we were able to get their input, which was so incredibly important uh, to be able to con uh, continue to move forward with this uh, four phase development. So it's a it's a big project. We're excited to, to say that it's a large project, um, but we're very excited about the progress that we've been making. So what you're seeing here is three office buildings. Uh, we acquired two properties uh, right when our land banking uh, took off, and then we acquired two additional properties that had three commercial buildings on it. So the three commercial buildings was the office building, the warehouse, and the church building. We deemed that the uh, that the office building, uh, it was in pretty bad shape, but it could be rehabbed. And that's the other piece that we find is, you know, it's easy just to tear down buildings, but it loses the character of the community. And we think it's so incredibly important to be able to save that character. You know, not everything can be bold, should be bold out, bold, uh, bulldozed over and started from scratch, right? There's, there's strength in that community character and, and then the history that these buildings have as well. And so, you know, at all costs, we wanna preserve that as much as possible. And I think that that's important. So this was before, uh, and we were able to rehab it and give it a beautiful blue ocean floor. Uh, and this is what it looks like now. Um, and I'm excited to say that our, our first two partners that will be moving into the cultural campus are Casa Chiapas, which focuses on the Chiapas Mexican population. We have one of the largest Chiapas Mexican populations in the United States, actually here in the university area. And what's different about this specific subset of population is they speak a Mayan dialect. So it's critically important that we help them speak English and Spanish um, to be able to fit in with the community and be able to get the services and needs that they have. So Casa Chiapas is one of our anchors and they serve that specific population. The other one is uh, Can Do, which is Caribbean American National Development Organization, and they obviously serve the Caribbean population. And so there are other anchors that are really anchoring this cultural campus development. Uh, the next thing that we're going to be doing, we have artists that are working together to create a, a mural like you see here. Um, they're going to be doing a mural to celebrate the two, two different cultures, and they're going to be wrapping it. So we hope to do that in the next couple months to really bring life uh, to the cultural campus as one of the first ones, uh, first developments there. The second one is the warehouse. And I just love the warehouse. Everyone said, tear it down, tear it down, and had these beautiful uh, metal beams and this uh, this design inside that I was like, we have to save it. And so when the, uh, the structural engineer said, 
it sound, I was very excited because I wanted to find out how we could reuse this site. So we, uh, we went through a lot of different uh, design plannings uh, and, and share it with the community to talk about what this space could be. And as you can see here um, from this, there was a lot of different options. Uh, and it was really important that this space serve as a community space where all different kinds of partners could come in and utilize the space. And so from there, uh, we determined that we really needed to be able to use this space, not as an outdoor space, but an indoor space. And so we worked through several iterations to have what you see here, which is really exciting. Um, the space is going to be used in a way that um, we can close off the space and open the space and use it from uh, anything from yoga to community conversations to uh, we're going to have housing and legal and immigration services there, as well as different educational workshops. Uh, we're very, very excited um, about the, the progress for this. Uh, the, these are the designs that we're going to be implementing. We're working on construction drawings as we speak, and we're hoping that our congresswoman is going to come back from, uh, from uh, uh, the Capitol with $2 million to help us do this and the site work that we need on the property. So we should know about that uh, next month. So keep your fingers crossed for us because this will be so important for the community. Uh, the third building on the site is the a church building, um, and that was deemed uh, not up to code, so we just demolished it, which was uh, kind of fun to do, and it really opened up the site. Um, and now I'm going to show you our three phase development, so you can get an idea of the three phases. So the first um, phase was just acquisition of the property, um, rehabbing that little office space. Phase two is rehabbing the warehouse, which you saw the designs for that. Uh, phase three will be a capital campaign to raise uh, a lot of money to be able to build the cultural center that's going to be on the corner. And then phase four, uh, which is the last phase, is housing on the property. So it's really taking a, a true uh, mixed use design to this community that has never happened before. We're challenging everything from setbacks to on-street parking, all kinds of things that the, the county is telling us that you can't do that. And we say, we can, we can, and we should, um, because this is a walkable community and we shouldn't have the entire place um, concrete just for parking. Uh, so we're very, very excited about the cultural campus uh, and all of the opportunities that it presents and also what it presents for the community. If we're able to get the zoning, this PD zoning with everything that we want included, it'll open up other opportunities for developments that we want to do in the future as well. Um, so it might be a little bit of a hard fight for this, but it will be worth it in the, in the long run because we'll have a site like this that we'll be able to mirror in other areas and show um, you know, preference for that as well. So very excited about that. And these are just some, some renderings of what it would look like on the corner. You see that open uh, community space that turns in. And this is the main street that turns into the park. Uh, and then you see the housing element that's there as well. The second development I'm very excited to show you is called Uptown Sky. It's our multifamily housing development. Um, very excited about this. It was on uh, 12th Street in Fletcher, which you probably don't know where that is, um, but it's just a couple miles from the University of South Florida, right in our focus area. But we were able to acquire about three parcels of land, uh, three acres of land, uh, and to build Uptown Sky. And what's special about Uptown Sky is this is for the very low in income. Uh, and we were able to acquire this property uh, through a 4% tax credit deal paired with uh, some uh, $5.8 million funding from our Hillsborough County Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Uh, to be able to make this uh, development a go, which was very, very exciting. You can see this aerial, but it's going to look like the parking in the back as well. What's great, really cool about this property is that we're going to have UACDC programs and services at the bottom floor. So we'll have a, a computer lab and workforce uh, area, and we'll have a multi-purpose room um, to be able to do programming and services as well. And, uh, you know, my partner, uh, Blue Sky Communities, uh, was so great to allow us to have a pool, which was hard to make the numbers work. Um, but because of the, you know, in, we live in Florida, there's so much water around us and our kids in the community don't learn to swim because there's no pools in the community. So it's really important to be able to put in a, a pool to be able to uh, offer swimming lessons for these kids because that's, that's really important for us. And this is just some information about how we were able to make it all happen and uh, layering and doing a capital stack of all these funding. Uh, and I'm excited to say we broke ground on it two weeks ago. So this is a fresh picture and we are, uh, Super excited to go vertical and it's happening. And it, at the end of the day, it's home for 61 families, which is the most important thing. Uh, right now, attainable housing is uh, very hard to find in this community. The housing uh, stock is very limited. Um, the rent is astronomical. And so being able to provide a home for 61 families is just so incredibly important. 
Development number three, uh, it's a hot mess. And I call it moat property because it looks like a moat. Uh, and when I acquired this property, everyone thought I was crazy because, um, well, that's what it looks like. And uh, the bottom right corner, you can see that's actually a road. That's 140th. Uh, I, I put it against any road in any city. It's the worst you've ever seen. Uh, I mean, you can barely go through it without uh, blowing a tire. Um, and these are the conditions that we have in this community. And um, that was the reason I wanted this property so bad is that, you know, if you can really take on the challenge and the blight, the impact that it can have on the overall community is so incredible. And so um, we're working hard on this property to find innovative ways. We have the EPC and the EPA working with us as well to uh, think of some innovative solutions. We put it out for options for the community. Uh, we did the same thing. We said, hey, we need your feedback. This is your community. This is where the park is. Uh, this is where our center is. As you can see, that's our, uh, our 50,000 square foot facility that I'm in now. Um, and we want to know what you, what you want to see in this community. Uh, we, we're going to give you four options. We're going to give you an option for single family homes, townhomes, uh, townhomes in a neighborhood market, uh, or 16 multifamily homes in a bodega. And after the feedback came in, it was unanimous that they wanted they wanted home ownership. So their first was, their first uh, option was single family cottages or townhomes. And so that's what we're working to build there in the community. Uh, because there's a wetland on the property, we're gonna be uh, being creative and turning it into a park, a second park. Uh, so the community can utilize it and taking that negative aspect of um, that wetland that looks uh, like a hot mess and turning it into a beautiful uh, project that, that residents can really enjoy and observe the nature in it. So we're really excited to move this project forward uh, with the help of all of our partners that are working on it. And again, investment plus vision equals change, right? No one could see that vision of what that could be, um, but I could, I could see it. Uh, and, you know, fortunately my staff could see it too. They didn't think I was crazy. Um, and we're now working hard with our partners to create that change that's so incredibly important. The fourth development is university townhomes. Again, home ownership was important to our community. And so that's what we sought out to do. We acquired one, two, three, four, five parcels. Uh, they're not contiguous, but they're all on the same block across the street from the park. And we've worked um, with our, our designers to figure out different ways to be able to build these townhomes, front loading or back loading. And uh, this is a conceptual drawing of what they're gonna look like. And again, these are gonna be for home ownership. So right now we're uh, looking at uh, being able to serve 80% uh, or below area immediate income, um, between 50 to 80% uh, of the area immediate income for these uh, townhomes. And uh, looking at doing some different um, options for financing to be able to make uh, the payments for these about $1,100 uh, for the mortgage, which uh, you, just, you just can't find that anywhere. And again, the purpose of this is to the residents that are that are here in the community, we want them to be homeowners here. We want them to be able to, you know, lay lay roots and be able to be more in, integrated into the community and not just be a place they stay. It's a place they live, they own. Um, that's really important for us, uh, especially you know in equitable developments that that we're talking about. That that the community get these opportunities. So we're working hard on that. Uh, the fifth development is our scattered site housing development. So you can see all of these parcels. And I just wanted to show this one is this is really how it comes to life. You never know when these developments are gonna specifically hit, but it's all about the land. If you own the land, then you get to build on the land and you get to start a development. If you don't own the land, it's hard to do anything. And so you can see what we own and what we don't own. And we're trying to acquire all of, the, all of those uh, parcels that you see in yellow. And one of them we have acquired, I need to update this slide. Uh, we really want to do a big development here um, because the need is so great. So we're working on that. And um, it's like I said, it's all different stages. Uh, the sixth development is our 22nd Street Garden Market. So uh, we're working hard to be able to launch this community market to help low minority businesses in the community really learn about um, how to take their business to the next level. So we're partnering with USF, University of South Florida, Moomba College of Business, their social uh, innovation and entrepreneurship program. And they're working directly with uh, small minority businesses uh, that we are giving them to be able to help them get to, to the next level. Uh, this is just a, a site design on what it would look like. Um, we're using the travel path that the neighborhood has already created. And on this specific set of property, they're already doing a community market. It's just illegally. And so we want to formalize that and be able to help those residents to be able to take it to the next level as well. And we think that that's important. 
So what that equals real community development and you know the real community development works uh, from the grassroots up and I think that's one of the reasons that we've been so successful is because we listen to the community we walk with them we talk with them we sit in their living rooms, we know their names we know their kids names we're engaging them um, on a level where you know it's it's meeting them where they are in life and, that, and that's so incredibly important. Uh, to be able to create real community change. The other piece that's really important and I wanted to mention is um, with all of the great uh, opportunities that are happening around this community, I talked about the threat of gentrification, of displacement, and it's already happening. We're already seeing it. So how do we protect our community? One of the things we're working on is creating a community benefits program. It's similar to a community benefits agreement where you know, developers that are coming into the community have to show us how they're going to benefit our community. And it can be through a number of different things. It can through, be through creating a pocket park or um, extending the you know, lighting or sidewalks. Um, they're building a daycare. 20% of that daycare can be open to the community because we desperately need daycares in the area. So we're looking at creating a different approach to be able to really uh, take advantage of the opportunity and growth that's happening around us, but ensure that that would strengthen our community and allow our residents to stay in this community um, and not push them out um, through gentrification, which, which we're already seeing happening. And if I talk really fast and uh, you're like, what, I want to see more about that development or I want to see you know, what she's doing, we've launched an interactive community map that's on our website. Our website is uacdc.org. And if you go to the top, you can click on community map and it takes you to an integrated map where you can look and if you want to look at our park, or if you want to see the attainable housing uh, developments that we have, you can click there and it'll auto populate and then you can dig a little bit deeper in, in, and look at the work that we're doing uh, in the heart of the university area community. The other piece I wanted to share is it, it is it, it is possible to do all of this work um, while creating a great ROI. And so uh, every dollar, 90 cents of every dollar goes directly back into the community. You know, and I, like I said, we were able to self-fund our land banking program at a, a tune of about $1.5 million. We run our organization like a business because it is. And every profit, which is important, goes directly back into the community. And so we're really aggressively and actively working to change the community um, because we're funding it. And, and that really helps bring partners to the table as well. And it wouldn't be possible without our staff and our partners and our residents who continue to make it happen. They you know, work tirelessly every day to help us in our journey to really create a fair and equitable community that we can be proud of uh, and our residents can be proud of. And this is my staff that makes it happen. So these are our agents of change. And I say, if you work for university area CDC, uh, it's your calling, it's your purpose, it's what you're meant to do. And if it's not, then it's not for you because uh, we have a lot of work to do and we need, uh, we need change agents who are really willing to give it their all and bring expertise levels to all the areas of engagement that we're focusing on. Uh, and that is my presentation. So I uh, appreciate your time and attention. And uh, I look forward to answering questions um, at the end of the presentation, uh, at the end of the next presentation. And I will stop sharing. And, and, and all that. Okay, For, first of all, I just wanted to say, boy, how, how inspiring was that? My gosh, I'm uh, just... The, the you know the inventiveness the creativeness the the passion and the transformation that you're able to uh, you know really um, you know see happen in real life it's just uh, phenomenal it's great it's really uh, really an inspiration Sarah so um I, I I'm coming from a little bit different perspective uh, when Juan asked me to speak it was about I guess the, the role of design and um, <clears throat> Uh, I guess work with you know development and developers, and so um, what I I, I kind of came up with a just a framework of thinking about some of the stories I'm going to be telling, which is public, private, private, public. So um, it's really about how change happens, um, you know, with, in cities, and uh, the role of design. And I'm going to do that by way of um, a handful of projects that kind of illustrate the different roles that designs played, the different roles that um, the public side, the private side, and the, the, the civic and um, community as well. Um, and so I'm going to start from there. Um, first of all, I just want to say my, I'm, I'm um, trained as an architect. I don't actually have a planning degree. Uh, I don't have any formal urban design training, but I've been at this for many years now and enough to kind of see some of these things happen. And um, I think the, the first thing is that, um, you know, as an architect, um, there's a certain amount of gratification. You know, you design the building, it, um, you see it built and then, you know, have, you have that ribbon cutting and there's, there's, there's an element of gratification. There's also, it, 
architecture is a team sport. It's a collaborative sport, but a uh, business, but um, there's also an element of kind of finiteness to, to that. Um, you get the commission and then, you know, the, it, it's done when the building is built and people are occupying. So, you know, as, as I moved in my career to um, uh, work in, in city, city scale, which I'd always, you know, that was always my intent. Um, I realized that, you know, your role as an urban designer or in um, urban transformation is really more like a, a relay, you know, one of the legs in a relay race, not even necessarily the last one, sometimes the first, sometimes the middle, sometimes the last. Um, but you're really, you know, you're taking the ball from someone, you're passing it on to someone else. And uh, it takes a long time, um, usually long after you're done with your particular leg. Um, so, uh, you know, that's an element that, you know, I've come to reflect on a lot in, in my career. And um, so uh, second thing I want to talk about was the different roles of um, uh, instigators of urban transformation, let's just say, right? Um, and this is, you know, oftentimes, you know, in, in, in basic terms, it's really, it's your client often. So um, there are, um, you know, change can come from um, the, the, the community organization level um, and uh, organizations like Sarah's. Um, you know, typically we see it, um, you know, from school, we read these books and the power broker and all of that. Um, we're talking about uh, change, how change happens and who, who starts it. Who, who pushes things through. Um, and um, usually the projects that, and the initiatives I've been work, I've worked on, like I said, it's more of a relay race. So it's, it's uh, we rarely see things from start to finish. And I, that's why, that's another reason why I'm so inspired by Sarah's stories. Um, but, you know, in school, we often think and we read about the, the, you know, these planners on the government side, right? The public sector uh, planners that get things going. Um, and that was very much the case in the early part of the century, right? And then, um, <clears throat> you know, we also know that there are a lot of changes led by or instigated by civic or business leaders. That's a picture of uh, David Rockefeller, who started the Lower Manhattan Association, which kind of uh, goes way, way back, um, got the resurgence of Lower Manhattan going, including the World Trade Centers, Battery Park City, and so forth. Um, and he's there with Mayor Lindsay and... Um, then, and then there's also community um, driven change. And this is a, uh, a picture of a community meeting at Diego Beekman, which has um, been really at the forefront of um, driving change in the South Bronx. <clears throat> uh, but then you also have developers, right? So, um, you know, this is an example of um, a development that took uh, decades, maybe generations. It started with the New York Central Rail, rail Yards on the west side of Manhattan um, in the in the 60s. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. It's called Riverside South now, but this is a project that languished for years. And then, it, you know, it really took the uh, risk-taking kind of bravado and, um, it, you know, frankly, vision of uh, and, and political kind of muscle of um, a very ambitious developer, a New York developer at the time. You all know this guy in a later um, life. And, um, you know, developers have a very important role to play. Um, and then, you know, what it is today, which is called Riverside South, which is a, you know, very thriving, vibrant uh, community on the west side of Manhattan. So um, all, all of these, you know, private, public, um, so forth, um, you know, had a, had a role to play in this transformation. Again, you could see what kind of timeline this took from the early 60s to the mid, mid 2000s. Um, so 40 years to, to, to play out. So, um, you know, I also wanted to talk about in, in the course of these uh, projects that I'm gonna go through, um, the role that design plays, you know, again, was asked to talk about development, but, um, you know, as a designer involved with cities, um, all the different places that that could take you and all the different issues, which I kind of, kind of find um, fascinating is, and it's kind of sustained me in the course of uh, my career. So the first one I'm going to talk about is a uh, development called Arvin by the Sea. This is in the Rockaway Peninsula. You could see Kennedy Airport here. Um, this is Jamaica Bay. Um, it, it was an area that was um, uh, really kind of a resort for New York City, before people could um, get on a plane and fly out to Florida, they would take a train and come out to the Rockaway Peninsula, enjoy the summer breezes and the beach, magnificent beach. Um, it was an area that fell into um, 
uh, situation of overcrowding. And there was a lot of um, uh, summer kind of cottages that existed and became kind of permanent housing after World War II when you know, folks came back from um, the war, um, they crowded the cities and um, became really a slum situation. Um, Robert Moses did play a hand in this, not in, not in this specific area, but in the peninsula. And this, uh, this small peninsula uh, on the south side of the borough of Queens eventually came to house about half of the uh, public housing in all of uh, that borough, which is over 2 million uh, people. Um, so in the 1960s, um, there's an area of about 300 acres um, in the Rockaway Peninsula that was cleared by the city for the intent of redevelopment and slum clearance. Now, this is at the point where the city started going broke. Um, this 300 acres um, went fallow and undeveloped for a um, better part of 30 years, or maybe four, almost 40 years. Um, there were actually literally packs of wild dogs that roamed through here because it was just, um, it was undeveloped and there was wetlands that developed. It's kind of reverting back to nature. And uh, through the years, there were many uh, private developers who came in and they pitched for, um, you know, their ideas on how to develop the site. Um, they kind of came and went. One of them was called Techno, uh, Destination Technodrome, uh, was a big, fantastic kind of um, uh, recreation destination. Another one was by a, a very uh, well-known national developer called Forest City for, um, you know, fairly high, higher density um, development, uh, all of which kind of crashed and burned. The city came in and um, they realized that they needed to take a leadership role. So they wrote down the value of the land. They created a new framework for development. Um, and then they realized that they needed the private sector to step in to implement, to take the risk, the um, you know, uh, use their knowledge of the market um, to actually uh, take the ball and advance that to, to build uh, housing and development. And then you know, at this point, you know, we stepped in. Um, we won a uh, solicitation a developer uh, RFP that the city issued with a team of developers from Long Island. And um, you know, again, the role of design. Um, looking at models that could inspire, models that were applicable, Forest Hills Gardens. Um, if you're not familiar with it, you should um, take a trip up to Queens and Forest Hills. It's um, really the first transitory development in the United States, and it's really a special place still to this day, and so many lessons to learn about city building, the mix of single family and multifamily, and um, the way that all roads kind of radiate from the, um, the train station. Um, you know, the power of ideas in designers. You talked about the power of drawing, but simple, simple diagram um, that uh, packs in this kind of very powerful idea of making uh, transit center of community. Well, you know, that idea, you know, it was happening at the beginning of the 20th century, as you just saw at um, Forest Hills, but um, it kind of got lost and it was revived with this um, really powerful diagram by planner called Peter Calthorpe in California in the 1990s. And so that was something that really inspired um, uh, this, this kind of idea of how to um, redevelop the land at Arvern by the sea, which is 120 acres. There was a subway station here on the A train, but it was the lowest subway, um, lowest rated subway station in the entire New York City system, 300 odd subway stations. And you know there was nobody to ride it, right? There's 300 acres of fallow land. So we decided to double down on that, really inspired by Peter Calthorpe's drawing um, diagram and um, the idea of transit oriented development. And we said, hey, look, let's make the whole thing about transit. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a crazy idea. The plan that came out um, had a mix of um, different housing uh, types and um, was all market rate. So you know, at the time, um, the uh, community leaders that really said, you know, look, we have enough um, affordable housing and low income and public housing here. We need um, the market to come in market rate housing so we can get the kind of uh, amenities um, and reinvestment in the community that will, you know, kind of benefit the, the larger community. And so, um, you know, again, we made the, the subway station the center of the community. We put, uh, wrapped the subway station uh, and shops made a little plaza, and um, that's actually played out. <clears throat> they actually end up renaming the subway station um, Arbor by the Sea, 
And um, we, we were able to incorporate a mix of housing types. So two family homes with an owner at the bottom, a renter on top, um, which help uh, first time home buyers, folks with um, extended families and so forth. Um, and mix that with um, higher density, you know, mid-rise six-story housing. So they're kind of side by side and um, they work very well together and uh, increase the access to the ocean, <clears throat> their new infrastructure, new roads. And, you know, the, the, the ocean and Rockaway Beach has really become a place for people to, to um, you know, to, to return to and be by the ocean and so forth. So which is really a, a very... Um, Kind of satisfying thing to see after so many years. Um, now, with that, you know, living by the ocean came all the risks that are entailed. And um, these are some photos right after uh, Hurricane Sandy in uh, 2012. And the Rockaways were kind of on the front line. They got devastated. Um, you know, with the new infrastructure that we were to put in up to the, the standards you know, that were current, um, we were able to main, you know, stay intact largely. Um, this illustrates our uh, arbor by the sea is right here. This is Kennedy Airport, um, the area you know that got affected by Sandy, and we were right at right right at the bullseye right here. And um, you know we benefited from a lot of investment, uh, a lot of infrastructure. However, it, it was um, infrastructure that you don't see. It was kind of um, hidden in plain sight, if you will. Um, we took measures by you know like uh, double sand dunes. Um, we elevated. Um, housing area, new water mains, a new um, boulevard that connected the, the, the east side of the peninsula with the west side, which was critical in um, emergency situation and evacuation, new drainage infrastructure that was also very, very important. And, you know, we saw that example that um, with Ida recently, that it's not just inundation and sandy type events, but it's also the, the massive rain events that we're going to have to worry about increasingly. Um, and uh, really created a, um, a use the infrastructure to create a place that people uh, wanted to be, right? Um, another uh, example of um, kind of this relationship and this kind of reciprocal relationship between the public and the private is a, a project that we're working on right now called Bayfront in Jersey City. It's on the west side of Jersey City. You can see here, uh, downtown Jersey City and then lower Manhattan. It's, a, it's about 100 acres of uh, brownfield. It was heavily contaminated. Um, Honeywell um, wasn't responsible. It's a you know, major corporation, <clears throat> was not responsible for the pollution. However, they took over the company that, um, that did do um, you know, most of the dumping and so forth, uh, Allied. And um, in the 1980s or 90s, you know, community activists said, hey, you know, we want some action here. We can't be living next to this um, awful brownfield forever. And they instigated change. Honeywell, um, there was a major lawsuit um, which lasted many, many years. And Honeywell um, did launch a cleanup. It was one of the biggest cleanups in the state. And um, actually, um, Blaustein, your, your own Tony Nelson led the, the planning for the first um, <clears throat> plan for Bayfront after that. Um, and, and this project kind of languished as well. This was, um, I think Tony was involved in 2005 or something. And we, this is Tony's plan right here. And so the bones were set and it was a very solid plan. We, we came back on in 2019 to dust, the, dust Tony's plan off, kind of get it ready for development, trying to incorporate all the things that um, have changed since um, uh, the time that Tony was involved. Um, you know, increased concern for resiliency, um, new development standards, trying to um, make sure that this was uh, ready and um, you know, set to go out to the market uh, and to flesh out some of the open spaces and development prototypes. And, um, you know, if you could see here the context, we're you know downtown Jersey City's here, Lower Manhattan's here. Bayfront is on the west side. It's kind of uh, uh, Jersey City's forgotten uh, riverfront, right? So all of the you see all the gleaming high rises, uh, what they call the Go Coast, on the Hudson River facing Manhattan, and then this side they actually have an equal amount of uh, riverfront facing the Hackensack. That's facing the port, it's facing the airport, but but it's a great resource, and it and um, it's got a um, 
potential with a notes with a one stop extension to have a uh, direct shot via light rail into downtown um, Jersey City, which connecting to the World Trade Center and then potential future extension to uh, the airport. And then what we're what we were proposing is, hey, look, let's look at this. You have a light rail station next to um, a river next to major job centers. This could be an intermodal point. Uh, where you could actually get to jobs, people could come in and commute downtown, but people could also, if they're living here, they could get to jobs by waterborne ferry. <clears throat> and here you can see the proximity of you know, all, all of that to Bayfront. Um, so, you know, the plan that we um, did, and this is, again, this is for the city. The city took leadership. They bought the land from Honeywell. This is a response to, um, affordable housing crisis that they're having in Jersey City. Um, they've had really explosive growth downtown, but that's caused major affordability issues, um, you know, in the city at large. And so the mayor, Philip, to his credit, he took leadership, he purchased the land, he put up a bond for um, uh, $70 million to do the infrastructure, and we're starting in on that. And so our approach really, you know, as representatives of the city, um, was to concentrate on the public realm, which is the thing that the city uh, had control over and access and so forth and make this um, a place that developers would want to and be interested in, in going to. So you see all the development parcels we left, we left white, right? That's for developers to come in, city again, taking the lead. <clears throat> um, we tried to um, create uh, concepts that people could start to uh, envision what some of these places, but the light rail, how's the light rail going to work with the rest of the community? And um, we did envisioning how, how's um, Route 440, which if any of you know that in Jersey City, is like one of those big, bad uh, boulevards. That, you know, it's, it's um, dominated by trucks and it's just no place you'd want to be. How can those things be transformed so people would want to uh, come in develop, it could be a place for the community, um, a place for a little bit better uh, retail than the dying strip malls that are there um, and ac accommodate different modes. We also tried to look at how to revitalize um, this riverfront frontage. And, um, you know, there's there's some movement toward that. If anyone of uh, you have ever taken a, uh, they have pontoon boat tours of the Jersey Meadowlands, which no one would typically think of, but it's actually beautiful there. Um, it used to be a place where they, you know, uh, sink cars and, uh, uh, you know, rumor, or I guess legend has it, bodies and so forth. Um, and certainly a lot of dumping and chemicals, but it's been uh, revitalized. Can that be extended, um, you know, down through Jersey City and be a, make the Hackensack side uh, equally as attractive as the Hudson side? And so we create, came up with the framework for a new park. Um, and try to come up with strategies to um, address the kind of deteriorating edge in a way that could bring new life, um, natural habitat, increase the resilience, and create a place that people want to be, a destination, um, attract developers, frankly. So we, we located several kind of discrete points um, that we felt could become destinations. Um, this one was called the Point. Um, where I, I love um, in front of the Ikea on um, exit 14 of the turnpike, you know, they have that cafe on the top floor and you can watch the jets come and go uh, and land, you know, at sunset. It's actually quite beautiful. You kind of have something like that here. Um, <clears throat> uh, intermodal transportation point for water taxis connect to the light rail. And um, also just looking at how the water's edge could be um, re-envisioned. Um, you know, and, and coming up with new strategies, again, to address resilience, uh, natural habitat, and so forth. Um, and right now we're going through uh, working with the state and the Army Corps to get permits for uh, all of this um, and create a different type of opportunity for people to get out by the water. On this side of town, um, people don't own yachts. Um, they don't have access to the water. And um, we want to try to make that possible. This is the, this, and the plan is kind of a, you know, it's the framework, but it's also a byproduct of all, you know, the, all of those things. Um, the, so, so I, I, I talked to, about a couple of projects that there was this kind of interplay with the private and the public, the public needing, uh, coming in at critical junctures to show leadership 
uh, to set the framework for development um, to accomplish you know, bigger public policy goals like affordable housing and so forth. Um, and um, you know, oftentimes, however, change is instigated by a third party. And um, in, in downtown Newark, um, if you're all familiar with, I'm sure, um, has been subject to uh, revitalization efforts for you know, decades. And a lot of that leadership came from business interests. Um, so this is a historic uh, image of uh, Military Park in downtown Brooklyn. And um, this is a, uh, an older aerial photo showing kind of the disinvestment that happened. And you all know that story after the 67 riots, people fled, businesses fled, and there's a lot of disinvestment. A lot of empty lots, as you can see here. This is Military Park right here. That's the, the view that I had just shown in this um, picture you know, uh, right here. It was, this was once the heart, very vibrant uh, public space. Um, the city and the state through the years, they invested in some pretty big um, um, you know, new initiatives. The NJ PAC was one, the arena, but you know, the rest of the downtown kind of wasn't happening. And so we, we were, we were uh, uh, retained by a group called New Newark, which was backed by um, a philanthropist, a businessman, Ray Chambers, um, to look at the area you know, right here next to Military Park. And what we saw was that um, what was left downtown, well, you know, the, the insurance company, there's a number of big companies, but the universities were a major player. And they, by and large, kind of kept to themselves uh, within their four walls, and for you know, for good reason, because it wasn't terribly attractive or even safe outside the campus walls. And so the strategy we came up with. So here, here's here's um, Rutgers. Here's Military Park in the downtown. Prudential um, headquarters is right here, and you know, it's you know, there's a lot of mangy areas around here. And so we zeroed in on this area in the purple um, between you know their main kind of the heart of downtown Military Park and the campus said, look, what needs to happen is we need to have a kind of a meeting of town and gown and we need the university to come out, um, take advantage of you know, the developable land and actually uh, start to kind of integrate with the rest of the city. And you know, this, these are some renderings that had happened. And um, it took many, many years. This is that area where we're talking about. Um, it's a little bit lower down view. The campus is back here, Military Park's here. Uh, Prudential's headquarters here. And, um, you know, um, with enough patience and fortitude, things, things do happen. A new headquarters, um, the revitalization of and redevelopment of the Haynes building. And then we, we got called um, to uh, work with a developer. Rutgers was interested in building their honors college. Um, and uh, this was the block right here. You could see that gap right there. And um, it was Honors Living Learning Community, which just opened this past fall. And um, uh, this is one of the rare times where you actually get to materialize, um, you know, the vision and be part of the actually, you know, um, you know I, I think uh, we showed the picture of the, um, the relay race, you know, be in on the first leg and then be in on the last leg as well. And, um, you know, this is a building that was designed from the outside in and the inside out. Um, trying to create a commons that integrated with the rest of the community, create ground level retail opportunities to make the streets more enlivened. Um, and, you know, we just opened. So um, sometimes it's very exciting to be part of the, the public, the private, the beginning, you know, and, and other legs of um, the, you know, this long urban transformation process. So, so these are, um, you know, development projects. Um, and I wanted to also just end with a couple of projects that um, can show how your work as planners, as urban designers, um, can actually start to engage in other types of issues that some, sometimes you never know about. So, so um, this is a, a project that was probably one of the more interesting that I've ever been involved with. It was the effort to close Rikers Island. We talked about the introduction um, the impact of COVID. Well, this this is something that's been brewing for many many years. Um, you know, you uh, many of you who live in the metropolitan area um, are familiar with the kind of a you know the just the awful things that are happening in Rikers this year alone. Thirteen people died. Uh, it's been a very trying period um, at Rikers Island. 
uh, both because of the COVID situation, um, the shortage of officers and so forth. So the city launched this um, three years ago, this effort to close Rikers Island. Again, culmination of uh, decades of lobbying and so forth. But the city took up this kind of leadership role to create a plan to replace it. So the idea was to um, replace Rikers Island with four different jails in four of the five boroughs, Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. And so to split that up, which, you know, uh, as of the time we started, it had over 8,000, about 8,500 um, detainees. Um, and uh, just a, a quick note, um, Rikers Island is a jail, it's not a prison. So Rikers Island is where you, when you get arrested, um, while you're waiting for trial, if you can't afford bail, you, you get um, put, it, put at Rikers Island. It's not a prison. After your sentence, you get sent to prison, you go to um, a <clears throat> state-owned facility, which is usually outside of New York City. And um, so, so many of the people who reside at or detained at Rikers Island are not people who have been uh, convicted of anything. Many of them are innocent, but they don't, you know, they're removed, they're in an island in the middle of, you know, Long Island Sound. And, um, you know, it's difficult to get there to visit. It's difficult for them to see their attorneys. And um, in terms of the brutality and all of the issues that you hear about, it's removed, it's not near anybody. And so, um, you know, it's, it's an environment and a location that um, actually kind of um, enables some of this kind of behavior. Here's an aerial photo of Rikers Island. And you can see over the years, um, you know, the, the, the jail population has declined dramatically. Um, crime has, as crime has gone down, um, New York City has been at the forefront. It actually has the lowest rate of incarceration of all large U.S. cities. Um, but, you know, we still are stuck with this kind of outmoded um, facility that's, again, removed from all the communities. Um, and it's actually, you know, what, what it found is turning people into criminals. If they weren't, they get turned into criminals, right? And also costs uh, enormous amounts to uh, house people. It's like over uh, 270000 dollars per year to house each detainee, which is insane, right? That's more than, you know, it's like four years of college to house one person for one year in jail. So we got involved. It's nothing I thought that I would ever get involved with, but um, there was a role. We came up with the plan to decant uh, Rikers into four different borough-based facilities. Um, and we, um, so, you know, how, how does an urban designer get involved with something like this? I'm not a jail expert, never never designed one, never worked on one. And in fact, my firm does not do anything of the kind. So we partnered with someone that knew about jails. We had an inside out approach and then an outside in approach. <clears throat> um, we looked at the needs, the, the firm that we work with looked at the needs of, uh, you know, the uh, detainees, you know, for health and safety and wellness. Um, but also uh, we looked at how this would work on the outside. So we looked at uh, we developed a new prototype, um, new urban design standards for how a facility would actually integrate in with the rest of the community. We did a massive amounts of outreach um, to, in, on all different levels um, to elected officials, public hearings, one-on-ones, um, -on uh, focus groups with officers, family members, we went up to different um, uh, detention facilities. <clears throat> Um, it wasn't always fun. Um, this is um, just a couple of snapshots of some of these meetings that we had had. Um, nobody wants a jail in their back, literally in their backyard. Um, but you know, many of these places, they were there already. We looked at and analyzed all the different sites um, to try to understand how a, a large facility could be integrated to uh, the neighborhood. In this case, uh, I showed you a picture earlier of a community group that led a lot of the development and revitalization in South Bronx, uh, they had their eyes on this. We we said, well, how about if we screen uh, part of this facility and um, with for an affordable housing development, um, you know, that the city would fund, and that's happening in different neighborhoods. We had different urban design issues, and so the power of design was very important um, to envision how a, a neighborhood-based jail might work within the context of a very dense and complicated city lessons learned all over the place. This is the existing Manhattan facility and there are restaurants at the base. It's a mixed use uh, jail. 
So there's a jail above. There are restaurants that I've been going to for years that I didn't even know there was a jail on top. We try to learn from those, um, uh, those lessons and trying to envision things that could happen on the ground level that would give the public a greater benefit. Um, how to um, <clears throat> create a more dignified entrances so people didn't have to wait outside in the cold and be treated like uh, prisoners just to visit family members. Um, more trans, literally more transparency, um, you know, more dignity, more of a civic presence. Um, <clears throat> this is the Brooklyn facility, which has a kind of a blank wall along major um, shopping corridor. Uh, could we take the lesson that we learned from Manhattan and have uh, mixed use and shops on the ground level? So again, people would not um, see that kind of dominant, you know, image of the justice system. And then, you know, finally, we came up with um, guidelines for massing, um, you know, height and so forth um, to ensure that these facilities would um, not, you know, be totally over dominating of the surrounding community. So these are these are roles, again, just trying to um, illustrate different um, roles that urban design can play um, and touch on different issues. And then the, the last one, whoops, that was totally out of place. The last one, and I'll end uh, on this, is um, long-term <clears throat> um, climate adaptation and resiliency. And, um, you know, we, we, so we've been involved and in, I think, you know, you got an idea from some of the waterfront work um, that I showed at Arvern and Bayfront um, in, in this issue of, um, uh, shoreline and coastal resiliency. And um, by virtue of that, we've been working with some very large uh, projects. This is in Monmouth County. Um, it's called um, it's called NJ Frames. It was something uh, project funded by NOAA. We partnered with Rutgers actually in the Jacques Cousteau Institute. Um, but our role here, so it's a lot of, uh, I think the instinct is that, well, you know, it's a, it's a landscape thing or it's an engineer thing. We want an engineer to deal with coastal resiliency, but there is a role for design. It's very important, um, you know, and, and part of that really is interpreting data and explaining it. You know, as designers, we're trained to um, uh, to really kind of make sense of patterns, so there is an order and um, there is something that people can understand. And so, you know, you're dealing with reams and reams of data uh, having to do with you know social phenomena, economic patterns, um, uh, flood data. Um, you know, existing infrastructure and so forth. How do you make sense of that? And so we, we, that's, that's where we think that the role of the designer can be very powerful and very important to interpret the data, make sense of it, try to figure out the patterns and set a direction uh, for uh, stakeholders and residents, but also to decision makers um, and to try to craft strategies for uh, how regions and towns and communities can adapt uh, to climate change in the future and to posit kind of these, these new futures in a way that people may be able to understand, also to communicate um, how um, their neighborhoods, their communities will change over time and the different um, impacts of, um, you know, over time that rising sea levels and climate change will create. So, um, so that's, that's um, it was a very quick tour of a lot of work and I just wanted to uh, expose you to some of the different roles that design can play. Um, the role of, you know, public and private, um, I think is a big one. You know, you're all in school and you're going to be facing kind of choices on which way to go. Um, they both have an important role. I encourage everyone to kind of think about spending time in both because I think being in the private sector helps should be, a, 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 you know, uh, be a better public servant. Um, and then I think being in the public helps you you know, be a better designer on the private side because you understand um, what the, the, the mutual needs are. So anyway, I'm going to end with that and um, hope I didn't go on too long. Thank you, Eric, so much for that. That was also really informative. Never learned too much actually about jails at all or even considered to think about them. But thank you. And also, Sarah, thank you so much too. That was that was actually really cool to see such you know little pieces turn into like a big, really big, big project. So that was amazing. Um, and to our audience, if you have any questions that you would like to ask our guests.
guest lecturers. Um, please feel free to, I guess, put it in the q and I think we already have one for Sarah because it was asked right after your presentation was done. Um, I'll just read it out loud right now, if you don't mind going for it. <laughs> sure. Um, so the question is, did it take much effort to gain trust and credibility from the community? And what were some of the struggles or successes on establishing yourself? And I'm assuming uh, up and uh, I'm not sure what it means. Um, something popped up saying that we would like to answer this live. Is that just the option, Justin? Sorry. Yeah, that's just making it okay. like dismissed. Yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, so, so I mean, I think that's one of the biggest uh, items that, that uh, developers or anyone coming into, you know, planning experiences, you know, how do you really gain the trust? And I have to say that uh, trust is the most important thing. Uh, if, if I had to boil it down to something as a, as a community developer, um, it's trust. Uh, and I think that oftentimes for, you know, urban communities that have been forgotten about or um, uh, haven't been included in, in the planning or the process, uh, they have this, this, uh, tenacity to want to push back because because they've been promised so many things and it hasn't been delivered and they don't have that trust. So, you know, I've been with this organization for 11 years and that was the biggest thing that, that uh, biggest challenge that I had. And so, you know, when we acquired that seven acres in the heart of the community in which I thought we were going to build housing um, and they said they wanted a park, the first thing that I did was I, I we built a community garden and, and people, I got a lot of criticism for, for that. Um, and that was, gosh, six years ago, seven years ago. Uh, and it's surprising, but I got a lot of criticism because they said of all things that this community needs, why would you start with the community garden? Um, and I said, well, first off, I'm a farmer's daughter from Colorado. And second off, um, we just needed to get out there and dig in the dirt and meet residents where they were. And so that was really the point of it was establishing that trust by harvesting vegetables. And still no one thought that this, this garden was for them. They, it was, took a year for them to really say, oh, this is our community garden. Um, and so we'd harvest vegetables, we'd go door to door, introducing ourselves, giving out vegetables, uh, talking with residents. Um, they have to see you, right? Like they have to see me, they have to see me. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not just I, I pop out of my office and go into the community, you know, once or twice a, a, a year, you know, whatever. No, I need to walk the streets. I need to talk with residents. They see my face, they introduce them to the staff. Uh, you start to gain trust. Um, from the community and then the community once they know you once those leaders in the community know you then they become the advocate for you oh no no that's sarah no you don't know and they are the ones that build the trust almost for you and so i just have to say it's so incredibly important if you're going to do this work the right way um from the ground up from the grassroots ground up to be able to really get that tr 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 trust from the community and once you have it um, they'll do anything for you. I mean, they will protect you. People often say, aren't you scared to go into this community? Um, you know, we, the, the crime is, is, is considerable, um, but I'm not just because I have so many friends in the community. I know them. Um, they, they literally will protect you because they know, um, they know your heart and they know you're genuine. And I, I just think building trust is so incredibly important. You can't just throw up a sign and say, we're having a community. And then you're like, well, why did no one come? Um, well, you know, first of all, where did you have the meeting? Second of all, um, you know, was it at a time that residents could get to it? Uh, so, you know, all of our meetings are held in the community. We have food, so we feed them. We have child care, so the kids can, you know, the kids, you find what are the barriers to residents not engaging? And then you knock down those barriers or figure out ways, you know, and I think one of the important pieces is as well is that you don't have to do this work alone. And that's why I talk to government a lot about, and I say, you don't have to hold the meetings, right? partner with the community developer, community, someone like us, an organization that already has tr trust, partner with those faith-based organizations that already have trust in the community, go to them, make your jobs easy, and then they'll pack those houses. You have them be the ones that are that are promoting it and talking about having the people come out to it. Don't try to do it on your own. Um, there's no way that you're not designed to be able to build the trust of the residents. Uh, you know, it just, it just doesn't work that way. So I think that Oftentimes it's really simple. Uh, it's just go to where the people are and where they already have trust. And then you'll get, you know, the feedback that you're seeking. Yeah, it's kind of like talking about your community garden. You know, you plant that seed and it'll just grow and grow and then spread all over that stuff. Absolutely. And you should see it now, right? Like mm -hmm. you can't, that's not my garden. That's, that is their garden. And they've taken ownership and pride and they're protecting that garden. And they're out there harvesting it and they're engaging and they're 
they're promoting it and they're getting more people involved into it. And so it's, you know, it's hands off now. It's not even our park. It's there. They're patrolling it. They're protecting it. They're cleaning it. All of that. It's like, um, but you have to put in those hard, hard years. Those are hard years where you don't get the return. You don't see it. Um, but you just got to keep fighting for it. And, and then it organically happens. And when it does, when that shift occurs, oh, it's just remarkable. It's a remarkable to experience that shift. Well, that's, that's a great answer. Thank you. So, uh, Sarah, uh, Professor, I'll ask a question. So when you help residents become homeowners, are there any conditions they must follow? For example, are they required to stay in the neighborhood for a minimum amount of time? Yeah, no, great, great question. Um, so when we, we're working, we're, doing, we're in the middle of that right now. Uh, and so one of the things that we're doing, obviously, they have to go through homeownership uh, counseling cl classes with a, a registered organization that does that. So we're bringing those organizations in. We're not doing that because that's not what we do. There's plenty of organizations out there. So we're having them come in and do all of those classes with them. Um, the other thing is, that is really important because, you know, prices are just astronomical right now. Um, what's to say that they're not going to, you know, buy this house, buy this townhome for, you know, about $200,000 and then, you know, turn around in six months and, and make a cool $100,000 profit on it. So what we're doing instead of doing a land trust, which I decided against because it's so hard to keep this, keep a land trust, um, the operations of it. I, I've just heard some horror stories from from others. Um, is that we're putting a land allura, a land use restriction agreement on the face of the deed, and then allow allowing it to cap. So you know it can only uh, if you are selling it, it's a five percent. Uh, we're looking at a five percent each year that you could get that investment. And if you are going to sell it, then you have to sell it for someone that qualifies at 80% the AMI. So those are the requirements for it to ensure that it does stay affordable for residents and it, and it continues to serve the purpose. Um, because, you know, we've done all of this hard work and then, uh, you know, you can see it slip out of your hands really, really easy if you don't put in those parameters to ensure that um, it stays affordable for residents. Thank you. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Because <clears throat> there is a lot of that going on in terms of Especially, I know in in the in the Tampa Bay area, the, the real estate is just like out of control. So, out of control. All right, Justin. Should we keep asking Sarah? Sure. So we'll switch one for Eric. To, I actually had a couple. I had I, a couple personal questions for Eric regarding his presentation. Or should we keep the questions that are uh, for Eric, uh, Sarah right now since they're in the chat? What should what do you think? Sure. Uh, yeah, you can ask Johnny's question. All right. So this is from um, one of our alumni, Johnny Malpica for Sarah. Um, he is asking, um, how do you balance community desires and what they actually need? Uh, more specifically, do you ever find that the community asks for, um, say, through a design charrette, family, single, uh, through a design charrette, um, single family houses, or um, create a mix of housing. Um, all right, let me keep going. Uh, do you ever find, do you ever see yourself finding that you need to do any steering of community interest to benefit the overall vision? If so, how do you approach that? Yeah, no, ex excellent question. I always say that um, if you're gonna ask the question, be prepared for what kind of response you're gonna get, right? So if you go out to the community and you say, here's this land and it's here, um, what do you want to build on it? And and everyone comes back with, uh, we want to build a, uh, I don't, we want to build a, um, we want to build a barber shop, right? Okay, so this actually happens. So this is a good example. Uh, so what do we want to do on this land? We want to do a mixed use development and what's going to be here. So overwhelming response for a barber shop. And um, we canvassed the area. We kind of did a, a map to show all the barber shops that are in the community uh, and, and, one of the other things we found out was uh, who took the survey and it was all males within a certain age. Um, so we were like, oh, well, that was the reason we got that response as well. Uh, so then we had to go back to that group and explain and, and give a, a map and pinpoint all the barbershops that were in the community and doing our due diligence, we didn't really feel that a barbershop was necessary for this specific area. And that actually happened with the cultural campus. They wanted a barbershop on the cultural campus. Um, and so it was important for us to go back to them and talk to them about it. So they didn't just feel like we shut down their idea. And that was maybe, you know, one of the highest responses, um, but in light, and it was a conversation, right? Some, some people walked away still saying, I still think we need another barbershop, but the majority of people really understood as we gave them the education and helped map out all the other barbershops that were in the area. 
um, and help them understand. So yeah, I mean, I think that it's incredibly important. The other example that I'll use for the moat site is one of those options that we gave to the community um, was a grocery store. And I was scared to death. They were all going to come back and say they wanted a grocery store because then I'd have to build a grocery store. And I have no idea how to build a grocery store. But um, we're in a food desert, we're in a food swamp, so a grocery store would, would be likely a response for them. Just like I didn't know how to build a park, I was prepared to figure it out. Um, but, but like I said, don't throw it out there if you're not willing to entertain that idea or that option. Thankfully, they didn't want a grocery store just because I, that would have been a new one for me. Um, but uh, again, it's just so important to be able to have those conversations. And even if you don't go with what they want, explaining why and having that uncomfortable conversation of going back and forth as to why. Uh, I think sometimes we just have, have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, it takes some practice, but I've gotten very, very used to it. I mean, I, I don't wanna say I argue with residents, but I, I, uh, I debate with residents every single day on things like this. And uh, it just seems like because of our mutual respect, we can walk away being okay with different opinions and ideas, but just having, being able to entertain that notion that it's, okay to do that and to have that conversation about it where everyone walks away feeling like their point was made even though maybe it wasn't what we decided on everyone felt like their voice was heard and I think that's the most important piece uh, so Eric yeah uh, this question is from Professor Ayala uh, so how has the fluctuating construction cost affected the role of design on projects uh, what are the client expectations uh, for example, are they asking you to be more creative to save money or more frugal? A, 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 little, a little bit of both. And if you're talking about the immediate right now, yeah, it's, it's, it's a crazy time and a crazy market. And, um, you know, unpredictability is, you know, the worst thing for developers. Um, so, you know, um, it's, it's a little bit of both. I think for uh, the affordable projects, um, you know, there's always the need to um, use creativity in lieu of um, uh, dollars. Um, so, you know, you try to make and provide for the same, um, you know, amenities and so forth that you could with um, uh, market rate, but um, that's not always possible. So you have to compensate with other create more creative means. And in some ways, it's kind of more interesting as a design problem. I don't know if that answers. <laughs> there's, there's no good. There's no easy answer to dealing with the, the, the fluctuations that we're seeing right now. So, so he wrote a follow-up question. Uh, so, because of the economic shifts, are you finding yourself designing non-traditional projects like the jail facility? Um, no, the the jail facility came. The the the, the Rikers plan came up because of a social uh, and political issue. Um, I, I don't think. Well, you know, well, most of the projects I'm doing are kind of. Um, um, they're not responding to the immediate context of the economy. And, um, you know, like I said, they take, they, they take, they take decades. So, um, um, you know, I don't think we're immediately affected and, you know, we're working in different parts of the country. Some parts, you know, we're working in Nashville right now. It's, it's booming. Um, I don't know what down where, uh, Sarah is. It sounds like things are also, um, you know, hot, I guess, in terms of the, the market. So, um, no, I don't think that we're responding, you know, to immediate, you know, changes in the, you know, in the market. I think that the, you know, one thing right now with regard to um, COVID situation is that there's been a rediscovery of the public realm. And you could see that, you know, just coming out onto um, uh, all the street to see all the outdoor uh, cafes. And that that's a wonderful thing. Um, I think it needs to, you know, we had kind of the first phase of that. There's a certain amount of um, discovery and maybe even euphoria. And I think now that probably has to settle into a longer term arrangement. So, but, but I think that's a great thing for, for the public realm uh, in general in, in uh, American cities. Um, I also do have a follow up for Eric since you did bring up some uh, pandemic topics. Um, for regarding uh, Bayfront in Jersey City in that area, um, you kind of have, uh, starting from Newark, you have Newark, Harrison, Kearney Point, and now Bayfront. And those are looking like they're gonna be like transit oriented development. Um, is there any impact of, you know, moving forward now with, you know, commuting, like basically 
is the project to be rethought in a way of like maybe not so many people are going to be commuting to the city post pandemic um even though these city like these small towns connecting to the city are pretty much the past 10 20 years have been developed to be transit oriented yeah i think that that's a great question i think you know you're certainly not um seeing things bounce back you know immediately even though you know people are starting to come back to the workforce but that traditional model of everyone coming into new york city you know in the morning and then leaving at the end of the day um you know that that's going to be permanently affected and i think to me one of the things that that um uh, points to is the greater need to pay attention again it's about public realm open space amenities and um i think you know like Midtown Manhattan, um, you know, Lower Manhattan, you've already seen that happen. I showed the picture of David Rockefeller, but that was a financial center. Like everybody went to work. The guy in the, what is the man in the gray flannel suit? Um, now it's a bit, it's a vibrant mixed use neighborhood. There's people living there, people working there. So I, I kind of think that like Midtown Manhattan will probably, you know, it's already starting to undergo a similar transformation uh, to a more mixed kind of uh, uh, environment. And I, I think that some of the smaller outlying communities will similarly, you know, they there's this big suck of jobs that went into New York City in the last 20, 25, 30 years. Um, you know, places that had employment centers outside of Manhattan um, lost them. And I think they'll start to, it seems to me that, you know, if uh, communities, smaller communities can show that they have amenities uh, you know, certain quality of life, restaurants and so forth, um, that, you know, perhaps some of that work comes back. And so the commute, commuting will still happen. There's certain things, you know, New York City provides and nowhere else can, but some, some of these places can become more mixed and full-fledged communities in their own right, which is a great, which is a great thing. Yeah, no, I, I noticed that pattern of you had the housing, commercial, public green space, housing, commercial, public green space for the Bayfront area. So that really stuck out yeah i think that that will um put it in good you know position you know going forward what, whatever it ends up being and if it's not all housing that's not a that's you know that's that's not a bad thing it's a good thing actually right mm -hmm. Uh, so, Sarah, uh, Professor Ayala asked a question for you. I like the conversion of the warehouse building. That was a great call. Do you find people needing spaces like the one you were designing in the warehouse for business startups or innovation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've been actually having those those conversations about um, the the new cultural campus or the new cultural center that we'll be building in the corner, not necessarily the warehouse. Although uh, it might get started at the warehouse and move to the uh, cultural center, but yes, uh, we're we're specifically seeing that, especially through the startup of the community market, which we're really uh, engaging with uh, uh, small minority businesses in the community. We're starting to see that that's accelerating, and there's going to be a shift that comes just across the street into the cultural campus, which is really cool to kind of see this organically shift and shape and move. Um, and you know, we have some some time for that uh, cultural center on uh, building on the corner. So I'm excited to see how that's going to evolve after we renovate the warehouse and, and see the needs grow. Um, but I can see it's going to be largely populated on the bottom floor with small businesses. Um, we, we definitely want a coffee shop. That's been my goal for the last six years is to bring the, the community together with a coffee shop and flow a tree and all of those things to activate the community. Um, so it'll be an exciting adventure for the next uh, five years to see how it grows. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Like the hyper local strategy versus like the larger. Um, so this anonymous question, I feel like applies uh, to both of you equally. Um, so can you speak to the dynamic uh, being visionaries and action oriented individuals who live and solve problems in the present? Um, how you navigate through bureaucracy and regulations that really are not up to the task um, up to task for today? I'll just give my two cents on it. Oh, it's so frustrating. Um, I'm so thankful that I don't have a lot of red tape and that's why you see all of the work that we've done is because we don't have red tape. And so, you know, I think that, you know, finding ways to be able to do the work that you need to do um, and with innovative funding sources, that's why I'm exploring different capital stacks, different funding sources, different, um, that's why, you know, the Uptown Sky is a, a LIHTC deal um, 
because that's how we can build it for very low and low income um, uh, residents, you know, for housing. And I think that looking outside of that as well, um, you know, I, I create, I've already created three endowment funds and then using that revenue profit to be able to fund some of these other things that I'm spinning off. Um, just because every time we get a grant for from the government, I hate to say it, um, the strings that are attached and the red tape, it's so incredibly difficult. So um, I would just have to say that uh, I really enjoy not having that red tape. And the more that I'm experiencing um, being able to work without the red tape, the more I want it more um, just because of uh, the innovation that you're able to do um, and and also the speed i think that's the piece for me is so important is the the speed and the flexibility that you can you can do um you know when you have government funding and then when you don't um it's just it's pretty pretty amazing so i continue to go to those government meetings though and talk to them how important it is to relax some other standards and and really challenge it to do to say well why do you have this here what is it? you know it's not coming from a federal level so are you adding another layer of complexity on here and why you know so i think that we have to continue to challenge those status quo that have always, they've always done it that way and ask why, ask those probing questions as to why, because it's not helping our communities and we're not doing things faster. And right now, you know, especially attainable housing and affordable housing, we're in a crisis. So, you know, this is the time to um, revisit some of the policies that we have in place in order to really meet the needs of the residents who are desperately crying for our help. So no red tape for me. I, I would, I would, um, you know, I'm no, and I'm no fan of the red tape, and I kind of think that you know, the, all the different stories and the examples that Sarah cited is exactly, you know, that's the most effective. Just be creative, nimble, resourceful, and try to, you know, it's always about the workarounds. Um, I think that, I mean, a case, a case in point um, is there are a couple, right? In New York City. Um, if you've been there recently, you've seen all the bike lanes and the, 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 the pocket parks and so forth that are out on the street. And um, that all happened, you know, um, without a big, massive plan that had to go through environmental approvals and so forth. And um, that was done as, you know, started as pilot program in, under the Blue, Bloomberg um, uh, administration. Um, and they, they put some pots, they had some paint. They said it's a temporary thing. Let's see how it works. People were good with it and they kept going, right? And so they were resourceful. This is the city working against its own regulations, right? So now you see in the pandemic, um, we talked about the um, the outdoor cafes and um, you know all of the things that are happening on the, the, in the public realm. And uh, a lot of that, um, you know, if you have to go by the book, it, they would never have happened, right? Um, fr franchise, right? So people have been trying to do outdoor cafes in New York City for years, and it takes years. All the different agencies and boards that you have to get approval to for, um, and you know, it just it it happens. So that that's an example of you know um, of, of how an emergency kind of cat like like this situation can catalyze change. Um, the the other thing, you know, from my standpoint, some of the I understand the um, the need for regulation, right? Uh, particularly with regard to the environment and so forth. But um, with climate change, uh, we're going to need to be more resourceful, more flexible, and more open about different approaches as well. And so I think that a lot of the um, the, the the states, the cities, communities are trying to shift. Um, so they can respond to things, but the, the regulations have not caught up to the policy. And um, I think that's, that's going to be a big thing, you know, in the next several years is that the, the, the policies or excuse me, regulations that have been in place in years, you can't do this along the waterfront, you can't do that. They're going to have to start to, you know, to, to be more flexible to allow people to, to respond, so. No, really great responses. And I think um, before we do our closing remarks, we have one last question for the both of you from Ken Stapleton. And he asks, both of you have worked around community partnerships with universities. How are you managing to grow them? Uh, well, I'll take this one. And I have to give a shout out to Ken Stapleton. Uh, he came and did some work in our community and we created a community safety action plan that was like 200 pages long. Uh, but we're still following that plan, and it, it's been so instrumental um, as we look at, you know, development and, you know, through uh, see, through safe design and whatnot. So shout out to Ken for uh, doing some amazing work in this community. And my response to how we're engaging the university, you know, we, we've tried and we 
beat our heads against the wall for years going from the top down and, and struggled. Uh, and again, be mindful that we're just right outside of the university area community. So this is their community really, as much as they might not want to admit it. Um, and so we've changed our approach and we're going from the bottom up. So we're working with uh, each individual professor and their classes and they're bringing their, their classrooms to our community. Um, we're hosting at the Hope Center. They're in, involved in our gardening and um, doing aquaponics and uh, helping us with um, actually uh, uh, design standards that we're trying to implement as well. So we went from the bottom up and it's led all the way up to the deans of all of the universities. And so I just have to say that that approach uh, has been working for us. And while it might have been um, a little bit harder, obviously, to trickle in from individual professors and students and then work your way up to faculty all the way up to the deans, um, it, it's working. So, you know, I, I just say if you're having a hard time coming from the top down, um, you can always go from the bottom up like we did. And now we're finally starting to see some uh, results and par partnerships that are truly making a difference. So uh, that's what we did. So I, I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, necessarily at the position of work about the comment on the bottom up. I, I again, I take my hat off to the work that Sarah's doing. Um, I do see the need for partnerships. You know, again, with the nobody likes doing that, but you know, the the public sector um, is necessary for a lot of this, and you're starting to see some of that in, um, you know, in Manhattan with you know Cornell Tech and um, there's new initiatives on Governor's Island and so forth uh, to encourage, um, you know, the partnership and the town gown kind of um, uh, come, town and gown come together. A lot, a lot of uh, cities, uh, particularly in the you know, Midwest and um, Southern tier in New York and so forth, the, the um, it's, you know, you hear this term eds and meds, right? But the schools are so important um, to economic development. And then similarly, you know, the campuses can't just do what they had done, always done, which is kind of stay within their four walls. They need to kind of have um, more flexibility to work with the communities, work with, um, to, you know, public, private and developers and so forth. That's how we had done the, um, the Honors Living Learning uh, uh, community in Rutgers. Um, so I think that's, that's just, that's got to continue, um, you know, the, 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 the health of the universities are really integral now to the health of a lot of downtowns. Um, and, um, yeah, you know, that the, the partnerships are going to become more and more important to the health of both. So. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's definitely a conversation that's taking place here at Rutgers too. New Brunswick yep. uh, is yep, continuously under redevelopment efforts and there are a lot of actors to include in these conversations. So that makes sense, yeah. 